Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. I'm really glad that you're here and I'm really glad you're here for this series. We are um, in a series that we dreamed up called For the Love of Faith Shakers. Um, You know me, I am interested in healthy disruptors, right? I'm interested in leaders and thinkers and creators that press hard on forms that are no longer holding or serving well, um, who ask hard questions, who um, move into challenging spaces. Um, I'm just intrigued by what people are doing out there still hanging on to, to their faith and daring to reimagine it in certain places or re-examine it um, because change is hard. Um, especially in the faith space, I think, but so necessary. Um, That's literally the way we grow. It is the way um, we develop and mature. Um, And change may be scary, but when the refusal to change upholds systems that have outgrown their usefulness or are prohibiting groups of people from, um, from being centered, from having leadership capacity, from being heard and valued, then change is just necessary. Um, so here we are with another episode in this series to talk, um, to an incredible, incredible woman today. Um, you know, historically religious leaders and faith spaces were responsible for some of the most beautiful and revered art and culture we've ever seen, you know? Um, and then somewhere along the line, there became sort of a strange boundary, particularly in the Western experience, um, between the creative arts and the church. Um, and when I say creative arts, I mean, at large, right. Not just like the band. Um, and so the truth is there are incredibly gifted, creative people of faith um, out there doing their work right now, impacting people far beyond the walls of the church, of course, like springing hope and peace and beauty and comfort. Um, and obviously one place that we are able to find these talented people in our world is social media. I know it has its pitfalls, obviously, but it has a few wins. And this is one of them because artists have created space for us to find beauty and connect with each other and with our own hearts and souls and even with God. Um, and so it's a thrill to watch them do this and then have this, um, this platform for the rest of us to have accessibility to what it is they make. Um, and build. And so our guest this week is one of those creators. Um, She's just profoundly talented. Um, I was so excited to talk to her about her art and how it has wildly resonated online um, and the sort of reconnective tissue it's creating among people and even between people and God. So y'all Morgan Harper Nichols is here today. Um, and if you know, you know, and a lot of, you know, so Morgan grew up in a Christian space really rooted in the African-American descendants of slaves church. Right. And so she says that she realized when she got to college that the way that church and faith integrated into her life was different than a lot of her fellow classmates. And, you know, maybe some of you can relate to that. Her, her church was firmly integrated into her community. Like it was what you talked about. It was a huge part of daily life. And so her art kind of follows that same thread. It's from a faith perspective, but it draws from a, a wider relatable place. Um, a human place that anybody can tap into uh, doubt and fear and anger and joy and pain and failure. Um, so it isn't like <laughs> Morgan's work isn't like word art, you know, we're not talking about live, laugh, love here. Um, her, hers is deep, deeply profound, incredibly wise, um, full of nature and light and drawings and, um, it's well-rounded in a way that just reaches a space that nothing else really can. Um, 
I don't know about you, but I started watching virtually everybody that I know um, and people of note discovering Morgan's art and poetry and sharing it online. Like all of a sudden, I just couldn't, I saw her stuff everywhere and I saw everybody sharing it. It was just like a breath of fresh air. Um, She's got almost 2 million followers on Instagram. And so they can't all be wrong, right? (laughs) Um, And they're not. So if that wasn't enough, Morgan has performed as a vocalist on several Grammy nominated nominated projects. She's written for a lot of artists, um, including a Billboard number one single performed by her sister, who you might also know, Jamie Grace. Like the family's packed with talent. Okay, Um, so Morgan's work can be found in Target, in Anthropology, other real retailers, and she's truly inspiring a whole generation of people through her work and her words. Um, She also released a book of poems and art that she created um, in response to the personal stories submitted by her friends and followers. And she has a new book called Peace is a Practice, which we'll talk about too. She's so special. Um, she's, she's wise. She's humble. She's gracious. She's generous. She's transparent. I've loved this conversation. I love her. Um, and if ever you wanted to watch an interview as opposed to just listen to it, you should pop over to my YouTube channel. um, So you can watch Morgan talk and her art is behind her and she's so striking in every possible way. Um, And so uh, we're lucky to have her today. I'm so happy that she said yes to this. I'm so thrilled to share with you my conversation with the absolutely wonderful and talented and beautiful Morgan Harper Nichols. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much for saying yes to this. Oh my goodness. Thank you for having me. My community loves you, but for the handful of them who are new to your work, um, I've filled my listeners in a little bit about, you know, who you are and kind of your credentials, but um, would you mind before we sort of get into it? um, Can can you high level for us who you are? where you are, um, what it is you do more or less, because then we'll kind of get granular on it. Yes, for sure. Yes. So my name is Morgan. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm an artist, visual artist, music artist, and a writer. A lot of times in the form of poetry. And I do a, I do a lot of different things. Like I have like an app, I have like journals with my art on it, all kinds of stuff. But I kind of just feel like at the end of the day, so much of what I do is just like what six-year-old Morgan would have just loved to do. Mm. So I'm, I'm very grateful that I even get to say that. I, Mm. I feel just so grateful that I even get to say that. So yeah, a lot of this is really just kind of finding curious, finding things that I'm curious about and ways to connect with people and in a way that, that also fills me up with a lot of peace and joy. So, yeah. Mm. I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit more about six-year-old Morgan, um, (laughs) because you've built like a really incredibly beautiful space with your art. And so, I mean, obviously you are suggesting that you were born this way. Um, (laughs) This is, you've always been a creative, you've always been drawn to beautiful things. Is that right? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Always. But it was interesting though. I wasn't like, I I always loved art as a kid, but I wasn't like, I feel like growing up, everyone knows like that kid who's like really good at art and like can Mm -hmm. really just draw anything. I wasn't one of those. Okay. I never saw it as like, oh, I'm going to grow up and do all these things with art. Because I mean, I could, I was literally drawing like stick figures and I just like the color in the people. Like I remember drawing stick figures and just drawing like a square shirt just because I'm Mm -hmm. like, I want to do all the colors to give them a shirt. So I wasn't, Uh, I wasn't even really good, you know, according to mm. other standards, but I do think that one thing that stood out is just like the affirmation that I got from my parents. Mm. Like I, they get a lot of credit for that because they were just for me me and my sister, both, they were just always cheering us on. They were just like, you can do stuff and Uh like try stuff. Like I literally remember like I'm talking like like two weeks before my freshman year of college, we had already like paid the money and everything. And it was all set to go, and my mom like turned around and said, "You know, you don't have to do this, right? Like, wow, like, you don't have to go to college if wow. you don't want to." She was like, "I just want to make that clear that that's not like we're not we don't want to 
you to feel like you have to go. And wow. I still end up going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but even while I was there, like my parents were like, are you sure this is what Oh my gosh. Be? I was the one convincing my parents. Like, <laughs> I, I like yo, college. let me get a college degree. <laughs> <know>. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, so I think that that was, I always like to mention that because I, I really, mm-hmm. as I talk to people as adults who have not had that like affirmed in them of like, yeah, you have ideas. You're free to mm-hmm. try things like, I'm like, yeah, it makes all the difference that we Mm. affirm that in each other. And sometimes it's parents, but it can be other people. But Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, to, I always say that as to like how I got where I am. I'm like, yeah, I got it as a little kid of like, Mm -hmm. oh yeah, like you should, you should share your ideas. You should share Mm -hmm. what you're creating. So yeah. Oh, I love that for um, all the parents listening who are parenting a a young creative um, Mm. to just set their feet on that path with confidence and with joy. And, um, I, I, that's a fantastic story about your parents. I was kind of raised by parents like that too, that just, I just didn't even know about limits because my parents (laughs) didn't think there were any. So (laughs) we just struck out in the world as if the world was our oyster because they suggested it was. So at this point, like to say that your art is known and beloved is an understatement. Um, this is, you have built something incredible. Like it's very, very powerful what you have created and built. Um, can you talk a little bit about this process, this, your particular journey to both like sharing your art, your poetry, um, and then locating it on social media where it just Mm -hmm. took on a whole new life. And what is, what has that experience been like for you? I don't know what you expected yeah. when you set out. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Oh, I did not expect mm-hmm. any of this. It was, it's really fascinating because I literally had, I had a whole, like so many different versions of trying to be an artist or creative in the world. And mm-hmm. another thing with that, even that I want to, I won't get like, <laughs> that I even want to like say like what motivated me to do that. And it took me a long time to figure it out of like, okay, mm. I got to just keep trying stuff. But I was like, oh no, that's what it was. And honestly, it was, it was financial stress. It, that's what it was. Yeah. I, I did not have a job and I didn't have a bunch of skills. I didn't have um, just the expertise, like the, the time that I did send out a resume, a lot of times I was denied, I was rejected. Mm. So even though, even though like I, I felt kind of like called to be a creative, a lot of what I ended up doing was just trying to survive, which I think mm. is, um, it's unfortunate that we live in a world and way too many people have that story. That's right. Just like, I'm just trying to figure out how to pay rent next month. And That's for right. many, many years, like that was my story. And I couldn't even get a regular job. Um, mm. Like fast forward to last year, ended up finding out that I'm autistic. I was diagnosed. And that actually mm. makes a lot of sense because a lot of mm. autistic people struggle with finding jobs and careers because mm. a lot of them just aren't made for us in the way we kind of think That's and right. operate. So I was all those years, I didn't know that. So I was just trying stuff. I'm like, mm. music career, let's try that. Yeah. I know how to play music. Uh, what about photography? Uh, I did yeah. weddings. Um, <laughs> what about a blog? What about this? What about that? Like just trying like, any little, any little thing mm. and, and having moments of connection with other people and having little things kind of take off here and there. But it was, it was a real struggle for me to figure out like, how do I, how do I, how can I get financial support as an artist? Honestly, that was a huge part of it. So I, I had to figure out what I could do that didn't require a bunch of money up front. And And a lot has changed now, but music, even like five years ago, it's very hard to like produce your own music. So of course, I was like, that's out the way. Like I don't have yeah. thousands of dollars to like yep. get someone to produce songs for me and all this stuff. So I was like, what can I do? Mm. And what I was left with was words. And I was like, you know what? All I need is a, is a cheap journal um, and a pen. And well, let me confess. It was not a cheap journal. It was a moleskin. And I was really proud of it. Add <laughs> it a like, girl. It was like Add my a girl. Moleskin, like yes. not floral. It was moleskin. <laughs> and I was a very much a perfectionist about everything mm-hmm. I wrote in there. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, I do have this. And yes, you do. on one particular night when I was just feeling like a total failure, feeling like I had just let down 
all the people who had supported me. Mm -hmm. And I was just feeling kind of embarrassed with myself Mm -hmm. of just how I tried and failed so publicly, Mm -hmm. (laughs) so many things. And that was the night I ended up writing a poem. And that is the thing that it ended up getting shared on Pinterest over a hundred thousand times. Yeah. And that to me was just such like a life altering moment for so many different reasons. It was Mm -hmm. like, wow, all this time I've been trying to do so many things. And as it turns out, people actually connect with me talking about my failure. (laughs) Like people actually connect with just me saying, yeah, this is how I feel. And this is Mm -hmm. how I'm trying to find grace in it. Mm. And I can honestly say that I built everything on that. I was like, I still have this insecurity. I still have this doubt. I still have these questions about my own life and who I am and how to operate in the world. I still was struck very much so struggling with my mental health, couldn't afford therapy at that time. Like it's just very kind of like real things that people end Mm -hmm. up going through. But I think the biggest shift was I just switched from like, okay, I don't have to figure all that stuff out like before I can just at least put it on paper. Mm-hmm. And some of those things that end up on paper ended up connecting with other people. So of course, yeah, it was a, when I look back on it, it was like, of course, but back yeah. then that, that felt like a shift. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I'm not, I'm not at all ashamed to say that the whole, you know, social media thing, it was getting yeah. to me. Like it was yeah. getting to me of like, if you're going to be here, then you need to look like you have it together. You need to, uh, of course, you know, if you're going to be yeah. in, and then I even feel like sometimes just as a black person, I feel that mm-hmm. I feel that expectation sometimes of like, wow, like our ancestors went through so much, mm-hmm. like you better bring it. Like you better, totally. <laughs> you better make something of yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it's, there's just a lot of pressure with that. And yeah, yeah. It, was, it was getting to me. And and yeah. eventually I was just like, I, I want to find a way. And I think I found that through poetry and art of like, yeah. there's a way to talk about those feelings, even that's without right. the answers. And mm-hmm. there's grace in that. So mm-hmm. that's what keeps me going. You know, I take whatever, whatever uncertainties are in my life. And I'm just, it, I don't, it's not even so much. I have to talk about them explicitly, like, mm. but it's just that feeling of, of uncertainty beneath is universal. So I just, that's exactly to, right. I continue to just say, okay, there, there's always going to be something. Um, so let's kind of paint our way and write our way through that. And, and at least remind each other that we're not alone. So that's kind of what, how I, how I arrived at that. And I, and I try to still write and share from that place. So your special brand of magic is this combination of that pretty bare transparency. Um, it's, it's pretty vulnerable, the things that you say, um, and that you, but so you have that, that first pillar of just being a truth teller, which we're all, that's the ubiquitous human experience. So it's not as you're hitting on something we are all literally experiencing in real time at the same time. Um, so you've got that courageous sort of approach as not just being, um, an answer giver, but a question asker. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, you wrap it in incredible talent, like your gift, uh, with language, with words, with distilling down a really common emotion or response into something so like beautiful and artistic and succinct is profound and rare. I I think what you do in the world is really, really rare. How has this um, felt to you? Because you now have a lot of attention. (laughs) <laughs> you are getting a lot of attention, deservedly so. Um, and I'm just, I'm curious how it feels to you. And I wonder if you could couple it a little bit, if you don't mind talking about it. And of course you can say, no, Jen, I don't want to, but if it's so interesting to hear you say, I, I have recently discovered I'm autistic, mm-hmm. um, yeah. which also kind of has some social, you know, issues around this much attention yeah. and spotlight and mm-hmm. s- people. And I-, I would just love to hear you say, okay, this is a lot in, in very recent history. I'm now yeah. kind of famous <laughs> and also I'm autistic and yeah. here's how this feels yeah. to me. Oh yeah. It is. It is a lot. And, and I have, I mean, just to be completely transparent, I mean, yeah. over this past year, I have had to ask 
myself a lot of questions about like, <laughs> how much do I share? If I share, yeah. um, you know, what, what is the kind of perception out there? And, and it's hard for me because as an autistic person, I don't naturally think about a lot of the unspoken social things that kind of yeah. happen in the world. And even when I received my diagnosis, like it was, it was empowering for me. And mm. it's like, I'm, I'm aware intellectually that, okay, yeah, people have stigmas and stuff like that. But for me, I wasn't even worried about them in that moment. Mm. It was empowering. However, when I shared it, it's like, I did like, <laughs> I had family, my family members of mine. I had my, my husband and my parents, they received messages from people that we know yeah. that were like, I'm so sorry about Morgan. Like, oh, like, mm. like I had passed away. And <laughs> like you had a terminal <laughs> illness. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's so uh, fascinating. The perception mm. yeah. that people have have around around you know just what they don't know a lot of times it's a totally. lack of knowledge and and some of the people were a bit more judgmental and had things to say than others some just mm-hmm. it was just like they just didn't understand but that really kind of set the tone of like oh this isn't like I just shared this part of myself and everyone's just going to be okay with it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, by sharing it, I have in some ways, like open myself up to like a lifetime of like people mm-hmm. not understanding fully. And yeah, sometimes that does get frustrating. Like I, I, I do sometimes struggle with like the balance of, okay, people kind of see me as someone mm-hmm. who is like sharing, like encouraging things but I, I don't always know how to articulate like what led to that bright painting <laughs> was a lot of like frustration about discrimination I've experienced or discrimination that I see or or just the the just the general pressure that I feel to like mm. make sure I talk about this in the right way. Mm. Um, and it's like it is also like <laughs> it's also this I feel like this constant fight I have against like the whole toxic positivity thing totally just like feeling like okay Mm -hmm. when I share this some not some a a lot of people have an expectation of like okay but you're good though now right Uh like now that you had the answers and you felt so empowered getting your diagnosis and now everything's fine I'm like no like I'm still learning about myself in real time like Mm. I'm still I'm creating new boundaries in real time Mm -hmm. I'm I'm recognizing that I have patterns in my life of years and years of things that I've said yes to just Mm. because I felt like I was supposed to I'm like yeah I feel like you're supposed to kind of, you know, hang out with people a certain amount of time in order for them to be considered friends. I feel like I'm supposed to do these things. And those are things I'm figuring out in real time. Like I, I don't have the answers for them. And that's, Mm -hmm. and that's hard. Like there's a lot of pressure there because it's, it's like people come to what I do to kind of find peace and joy and like kind of freedom to breathe, but it's like beneath yeah. that, I'm still a human and of course. I don't have that in every area of my life yet. So yeah, mm-hmm. I'm always trying to figure out how to kind of mm-hmm. share that and navigate that. I appreciate you saying that, that like for me, at least hearing you talk about that in just starkly human terms as a woman who's still in process and still evolving and developing it, that draws me to you. That doesn't push me away from you at all. That, that, that causes me to trust you more, um, mm-hmm. that you aren't selling easy answers mm-hmm. or even like a perfect story behind the creator. So uh, again, I put that in the category of part of your special magic, um, Mm -hmm. that you're just being genuine. But to me, that is a big draw. I think this is part of the reason people are responding to you so strongly, um, is that exact thing. I want to talk to you for a minute about what it means to you to be an artist who an artist of faith, who you incorporate a lot of faith into your work. Um, and I'd like to hear if you'd be willing to talk about it, your personal evolution, if you will, 
yeah. of faith. Particularly, I'm interested to hear what you have discovered and where you have grown at the intersection of faith and race and art. This is mm-hmm. this is a huge, huge one for me. Um, yeah. Because for whatever reason, I, I, I growing up ever since I was a kid, I was I questioned everything, <laughs> just mm. everything. But for yeah. some reason, I for some reason, I never questioned God's presence in my life. It was, yeah. it, was it was interesting because it was I I may have questioned a lot of like stuff that like church people would do and say. <laughs> of course, but for some reason, like at the end of the day, when I and I mean, I just get so emotional thinking about it, just thinking how much I struggled as a little kid, not knowing mm-hmm. I was autistic and not really yeah. having the tools to communicate. At some reason, at the end of the day, when I would go home and in our backyard and I would just like go right, we had this really steep hill right on the other side of our our carport. And like, I felt like God was with me as I ran. Mm-hmm. And it was just so freeing for me. And, and I'm so grateful that I had that because there's a whole lot of other stuff that I just didn't understand. I didn't understand why as a preacher's kid, there are certain expectations of you and, and, and how you should like sit <laughs> on the pew. Like people yeah. just have all these little, like, Oh, why mm-hmm. would you do that? Oh, totally. you do this? Not. And it was just so, so much. I'm like, I don't get it. But for some reason, God always felt very close in my life. And I felt that God felt even more close when I was creating because it was, that was a place where it didn't matter what other people thought. It didn't matter what the expectation was. I was free to just create. I was free to just write my stories that I would never finish and (laughs) just like put these things down. And I just felt so at peace. And it was interesting because it was like that creative practice that I ended up developing and growing as I got older with learning yeah. musical instruments, yeah. that ended up being the thing that became twofold because it made me a, in a lot of spaces, it made me a safe black person. It made me, yeah. oh, I have an acoustic guitar and there's a certain mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm certain like especially very southern evangelical spaces I was in and my sister dealt with this too of like we became safe black people of like Mm. okay they got that guitar so we know they're not gonna like start dancing or something you know on stage Mm. (laughs) or or, or try to or try to Mm. preach or something so we became safe black people and it was Mm. very hard because it was like this constant wrestling of like okay this thing that I feel on a deep spiritual level, I feel like I'm called to do. And I, it feels, I I feel alive when I'm creating, like I even remember during kind of, you know, these past few years, my sister and I, like we used to sing together all the time at different things. And obviously all the events stopped. And the first time we we sang together, like we did like a a live stream event and we sang together for like the first time in like over a year. And we were just, we just looked at each other like, Oh, that's the thing. Like yeah. that right there. Like there's mm. something that like that, that that's, there's like another realm there. Like, and oh, that gave me goosebumps. We've, we've always mm. had that as sisters and we've all, and I've just always had that with the ways I do art, but then it's like, you go into these spaces where like that very same thing mm. ends up being a vessel to kind of make you like, here's a black person that we're cool Mm. with. And that's what ended up happening. And, and it's so Mm. hard for me because it's hard for me to even like really talk about it because I'm like, I don't want anyone who encountered me in those spaces to think, Oh, was that not genuine? Cause Mm. I don't think that I think if, if you had a meaningful connection with, with what I shared in that moment, I still feel like it was real. And at the Mm. same time, it's like, there is a subtext that I just had to kind of learn through and, and learn who am I when I get to create in a way Mm -hmm. that I feel like God has called me to create when I don't feel like I'm being used to be like a safe black person or Mm -hmm. like an example of, of how, Oh, look at us. Racism's over. Cause we brought a black person to our church. (laughs) So it's like, who am I without that? And Mm -hmm. I do think that as the years went on, like, especially over the past decade, I've been able to kind of remove myself from some spaces and say, 
yeah, I just don't want to be a part of that. And, yeah. and sometimes I'll even get pushed back. Like, why not? It's this big thing. And I'm just like, I, I just, I'm not in that space right now. Like I, yeah. I need to know who I am and I need to share from a place where I feel safe and I feel mm-hmm. free to, to be myself without mm-hmm. feeling like I have to like constantly filter and modify to totally fit, fit a mold. Yeah. So in that way, you know, for all of its many struggles and challenges, that's where the, you know, the lockdowns and, and quarantining and everything that started in 2020 has yeah. been a gift to me in that small mm-hmm. way. Obviously that's the whole greater thing is not a gift. But, yeah. <laughs> um, in that small way, having everything canceled gave me mm-hmm. a clean slate. Yeah, and that's it right. gave me an opportunity to see who am I and very similar to kind of six-year-old Morgan, mm. who am I before I, ha- I I enter into those spaces? I like that this. Made me really question mm. what I had to share with the world. So really those good. are the questions I've been asking now. And it's mm-hmm. been a very freeing place of discovering. Mm. Not always easy. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, so I know. <laughs> I know. I mean, you're talking to somebody who changed spiritual locations. Um, and so I understand what you are saying that when you decide to prioritize your own identity, your own gifts, um, your own convictions, um, your own sense of being whole in the world, not used, Mm -hmm. not, not a token, not, um, not a resource, um, (laughs) that sometimes that creates a lot of turmoil. And sometimes that means a complete departure from an entire subgroup mm-hmm. where you have been a darling. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a cost baked into that and there's loss, but there's also yep. a lot of liberation. Um, I know for me, I wouldn't go back. I mean, I wouldn't change it for a million dollars a day. Um, this just the simple sense of being true in the world um, mm-hmm. without having to f- follow the unspoken rules to, yeah. to protect my belonging. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm curious, and of course I'm, I, maybe you don't have an answer here, but having now sat, you know, for the last year and a half with that piece sort of removed n- against any of our will, uh, obviously mm-hmm. I've been canceled. How do you think this is going to inform the choices, the decisions that you make from when, when the world comes back, um, oh, because yeah. it's not like your invitations are going to dry up. They'll yeah. be there. They'll, mm-hmm. they'll come roaring right back into your inbox yeah. exactly from the same sources that they were in the beginning. And so I'm just curious if that is going to, if you're going to create sort of new, a new space around that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I am. I am becoming relentless about what I ah, said no to. I like this. And I, that that's mm. new for Morgan. That's great. <laughs> I would say like the old Morgan, if you will, was just like, oh, I should probably yeah. say yes, or I should fix this up nicely. But even now, like I've had some emails come through and I'm like, nope, I'm sorry. Not available. So good. <laughs> that's it. And, so and great. it's like, I, I think that there's just all of these, like you talked about like what's unspoken, like all these sort of uh-huh. unspoken rules yeah. about like, even just like how you should speak. Like if, if you're a woman or a young person, like, oh, you got to, you got to mm-hmm. kind of dress it up a little bit nicer. And, yeah. and yeah, there have been, I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Like mm-hmm. I, it's, it's just, I'm like, that's just not where I am right now. Mm-hmm. And, and I, and I really, another thing that I feel like I've cultivated a lot is paying attention to how, paying attention to how I feel in my body yeah, when I too. see certain requests come in. And I mean, everything from like, from like, you know, someone who's a reader of my work, an Instagram message all the way to, you know, something from like a corporation or something. I pay attention to how I feel in my body. I'm like, am Mm -hmm. I tensing up? Yeah. And if I'm tensing up, that's, that to me is the first red flag. Like, honestly, Mm -hmm. it's just like, do I have the capacity to take on something else (laughs) Mm -hmm. that just makes me tense up right away? Mm -hmm. And if it makes me just say, but what about, "Hmm, I don't understand what I'm like, oh, maybe there's Maybe that's a that maybe that's a no because I just don't understand what's going on. No, no, nothing against the person who sent it, but I just don't understand what's being asked of me, and I need I need to know what that is before I say yeah. yes. So that's been very new for me, and I and I and I see myself practicing that more and more. 
Um, I, and <laughs> it also helps that, I mean, I, I live in a house and I'm married to someone who is just significantly more direct in his life in every yeah. capacity that, than me. So sometimes yeah. I, he's like, yeah, say no. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Like, He'll help you hold right. that line. Yeah. It's <laughs> so, so that helps too. And mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of my friends even are like that too. Like yeah. a lot of my friends are just a lot more like bold, like, oh, don't say, don't worry about that. Like say no. Say I like no. this. So, that yeah. has been helpful to you, just surrounding myself with people who, and who can kind of like encourage me and they know where I'm at. They, they know, me. like I have uh-huh. so, I don't have like, like I'm an introvert and I don't have yeah. like a ton of friends, but the friends that I do talk to uh, that I can just text, these are yeah. people I've known for 10 years plus. And I love it. we may not talk every day, but it's like, they've seen me and they've known me through all of these shifts. They know me from, from when I was like a nobody artist Mm -hmm. to when I signed a record label at a contemporary Christian label in Nashville to when Mm -hmm. I left that label to when I started this new thing, they know me through Mm -hmm. all of that. So that, that to me is so wonderful that I'm like, yeah, when I run things by them, like they have this greater context. So that's something else I'm just grateful for. And I, and I feel totally. like I'm learning more of like, don't just like focus on in the head of uh-huh. like how to make it through, like pay attention to my body and also so like look around and ask people that I know and trust that yeah. kind of like help, you know, help me navigate through this. So that's absolutely my metric too. Um, mm-hmm. And it serves us well. Our bodies mm-hmm. are looking out for us. And so yeah. they don't have an agenda. Our bodies yeah. <laughs> have no agenda except to tell us what's true and real and send mm-hmm. us warning signs if we need them yeah. and yeah. try to keep us safe. So yeah. I that's new for me. And so I love hearing you say that. I feel like this, that conversation is turning inside mm-hmm. the community of a community of women of faith, which is mm-hmm. exciting. Like yeah, this is I, something yeah. I don't mm-hmm. want our daughters to have to be figuring out in their 40s. I think we're all sitting here fangirling over Morgan and her incredibly beautiful, heart-tugging work that she sends out to the world, right? Something else I'm always fangirling about, you know, my Rothy's. I love this brand because it's not just about their crazy, cute, crazy, comfortable shoes. Yes, that's important, but Rothy's is also literally doing good for the planet. They've repurposed millions of water bottles into their signature thread that goes into every single one of their products, which includes footwear for your whole fam, like men, kids, everyone, along with handbags and accessories. I'm on record for wearing Rothy's slip-on sneakers literally everywhere, but they have so many other great styles like loafers and ankle boots and flats. People Magazine even named their darling shoe called The Point, the best flat for their Style Awards 2021. And here's what else you need to know. The shoes aren't just comfy and cute. They're durable and washable. So this might be one of my favorite things about them because it's like you have a brand new pair every time you send them through the wash. So step up your shoes and accessories this spring and get ready to be asked, are those Rothy's? Plus get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash for the love. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash for the love. When Morgan was telling us about her six-year-old self and how she grew up with affirmation from her parents to try stuff and be curious and explore, it just reminded me so much of how important it is to encourage the minds of our own little makers and creators and curious ones, right? If you are parenting a young creative or builder or scientist, one way to set their feet on the path with confidence and joy is with KiwiCo. If you're not familiar with this company, they deliver science and art boxes to your door that open up whole new worlds for kids of all ages. And inside the boxes are hands-on projects, everything from the mechanics of everyday objects to the science of cooking to cool art and design techniques. They have so many options that spark curiosity and inspire creativity. And let it be known, these are real deal, legit engineering science and art projects. KiwiCo is not messing around. All right. We have a KiwiCo subscription for my nephews and they go crazy for them. Um, This is also a great gift idea for friends with kids. So step into spring and celebrate the season of discovery with a KiwiCo subscription. You guys can get 30% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line with code for the love at KiwiCo.com. So that's 30% off your first month at KiwiCo.com promo code for the love. 
I, I want to talk about your book. I mean, you just, you got, you have got your hands all over some stuff right now. Um, you've written a book and it's on the topic of peace, which feels both hard and timely. Like mm-hmm. you picked a hard subject, yeah. um, at a time when there's such a shortage of peace in our, not just our culture, but our world. Um, mm-hmm. it's hard. It's a hard thing to grapple with, honestly. Yeah. Like I can honestly, I can do love better than I can do peace. Mm. You know, I can pick another Christian thing, um, value, (laughs) and it seems easier to me than this one. I'd like to Mm. hear you talk about this book and how and why it was birthed in your heart, um, and what it was like to create it, to write it, um, what you learned from it, all of what you're hoping the readers take away from it. Yeah. Yes. Oh my goodness. Mm-hmm. I thanks for saying that. And I'm I'm so passionate about this topic because it's been a, a very important theme in my life. Mm-hmm. And I would say firstly, as an autistic person. So I when I talk about peace and, and I write about this in the book, I'm also talking about in the body, being in the body and breathing, taking deep breaths, inhaling and exhaling. And for me, as an autistic person who also has a sensory processing disorder, mm-hmm. that's not like a, like a, you know, thing I go do on like a spiritual retreat once a year, like, or, Oh, I'm going to focus on my breathing. Like I can't make uh-huh. it through the day without focusing mm-hmm. on my breathing that's good. because the, the sensory overload alone is freaking exhausting. Like I, mm-hmm. I can shut down after some loud music, after yeah. a, a pot falls in the kitchen. I mean, uh-huh. these things can cause me sometimes hours to reset. And Mm. for a very long time in my life, I had no language for that. I did not know why this was happening in my life. I thought, oh, maybe it's because I didn't sleep enough. Oh, maybe it's because Mm. I had too much caffeine, like I'm jittery. Like I had all of these thoughts as to why it was, but I never was able to get to the deeper issue. And, you know, obviously, you know, for me that ended up being, oh, I'm autistic. Like there's a way that my brain is, there's a way that I am in the world that can make these things happen. But the grace that I found in that is through all of that, I was able to continue to seek out moments to breathe, to seek out peace. Like when I was running down the hill on the other side of the carport, my parents' house, like that was me seeking peace. Mm -hmm. And I didn't always find it perfectly. I didn't always just walk away, you know, I'm six years old. Like I didn't walk away like, wow, I feel so much better about my life. Like everything's going to be okay. I didn't walk away feeling that way, but my body in that moment felt free to be at peace. And that's where I wrote this book from. I'm like, look, I I don't know how to, how to give you the step-by-step to find peace every day in life, but I do know it's something that we can practice. And here's something that I've been learning all along the way, all these little things. And I, and I truly believe that these little things are actually big things that add up to the bigger picture of how we can practice peace. So Mm. yeah, I just kind of gave myself permission to just nerd out in this book. Like I'm talking about, like, I'm talking about Benedictine monks in this book, Tracy Chapman, like (laughs) it is very much so like, look, here's all the stuff. It's, it's so good. Tracy, Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. this random dream I had with a yellow sled. Like it is literally (laughs) like those are three literal examples in the book. I gave myself permission to just nerd out and say, like, I hope this Mm. this gives other people permission to kind of look at all of those little particulars in their life. Like, wait a second, I have not figured out this whole peace thing in my life. And Uh I certainly haven't figured out for the whole world, but we have been practicing. So let's keep cultivating that practice. So good. I I think. Um, there's a temptation when we consider peace for it to be something nebulous that in some way that is mysterious and magical, just going to happen to us. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it's just going to land in our lap someday. And we're like, well, there it is. Damn. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting for that. (laughs) Um, When in fact it is a practice, like Mm -hmm. we get to practice peace to me, that feels so accessible. Like Mm. these are these little levers, like you said, that turn out to be big levers to pull yeah. Yeah. and they matter that breathing, that meditation. Like I worked all that into my life in the last year and a half, which was, these are new practices for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Profoundly impactful. Yeah. Like 
I mean, you're just breathing air, yeah. you know, we, we breathed air when we were born. So it just doesn't <laughs> seem like it could be so powerful and yet it is. And so, mm-hmm. and then music and art, I just love dreams. I love that you included everything. And, um, do you feel like you'll write again? Do you, did you? I, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. I, I feel like I have, you know, even to some of like the people who've been able to read it and say, oh, I appreciate this little thing. Like yeah. that was so healing for me. It's just like, oh my gosh, like other people appreciate when, yes. when we kind of get into these details. And I think in the past, I didn't want to write a book like this because I was just like, I don't want to talk about myself or a whole book. Like that's totally. <laughs> But it's like, the more I begin to read and just Mm. read how so many people observe the world and what they bring, and you're one of those people and and what they can kind of like take from that. I'm like, oh, it's so much more than, than just talking about your, it's just bigger picture. And, and I love being a part of that. So yeah. It's so great. Thank you as well for for being someone who has inspired me to continue Mm. writing. So Mm. I love this. Oh, I'm always like, more women at the table of writing. (laughs) Like let's pull up every single chair we can get our hands on and Mm -hmm. celebrate one another's work and champion each other's voices. Um, our, our perspectives, obviously, and our voices, particularly you as a woman of color have just been so marginalized for so long. It was just Mm -hmm. such a a centered voice of just white men. And so it's Mm -hmm. so I'm like, banging the drum for you. And for Mm. all the women who are like, I don't know if I should, I'm like, you should like, you should (laughs) pick up that pin. Absolutely. Um, Pick up that pin. Okay. I'm going to ask you, these are the just kind of like off the top of your head questions. I'm asking everybody in this particular faith shakers, um, series. And so, Mm. um, here's the first one. What is the biggest shakeup that you have had in your own faith journey? And and how, if it did, did that change your view on religion or God? Yeah, it was realizing and even realizing even more over the past couple of years, like, oh, when people talk about Jesus, we're not all talking about the same person here. Um, (laughs) It's like, we are disorienting. We are, but we aren't. And that has been Mm. huge for me because I have spent, I spent years of my life in particularly Christian spaces where I thought we were talking about the same thing and we were not. We weren't. And there's so many different specifics of it, but just because I already touched on it, I'll just kind of go back into that of like Mm -hmm. just seeing the the vicious hatred toward a phrase such as black lives matter, right. Seeing specific people that I used to quote and listen to just denounce any kind of conversation about this in the name of Jesus is I think spiritually traumatizing. Yes, that's right. Because it's like, this is somebody that you, I I thought we were on the same page. That's right. And the amount of times I've said that over the past few years, oh my gosh, like we're not even the same library. Like we're not even on the same street. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not even me trying to be like, oh, I'm so morally superior. No, that's not me. That's no, I don't have figured all figured out either, but you know, the Jesus that I connected with as a kid and especially in the particular context that I was in in this small black church in Stone Mountain Georgia yeah was a Jesus who was the friend to the oppressed that's right who stood up for the oppressed who mm-hmm. broke social norms and say yeah that person is who we're talking to even when his own students were telling him no 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 not them no that's right. I'm actually yeah over here to the side, Mm -hmm. this woman who you consider to be less than unworthy of even acknowledging that's what we're after is, and not in like this weird, you know, complex of like, oh, it's like, we're being present to that person. Mm -hmm. And that's where the love is. That's where we're, that's what we're after. It's not like the sidebar thing. So it's just been, Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I, what, what connected me. And, and even as I left, like 
being in the, as I left the home of being like a preacher's kid and, and went to the, the world, if you will, like, that's what, how, I, how I identified as, as a Christian and, mm-hmm. and how I, how that word became something of my own. Mm-hmm. And, and it has been a struggle yeah. to, to carry that word when I know what it means to mm-hmm. other people. And even with my work, I'm, I'm asked a lot of times, why don't you say God in your poem? Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting because always, this is always my response. And literally every time I, <laughs> I respond, they say, oh, I say, because I'm sharing what God is sharing with me. Mm-hmm. I'm not just talking about God. That's good. Like I feel close to God and I talk to God and I talk to God while I'm creating. I recognize that in the same way that I have in, in my life, especially as I grew up and entered into some more white spaces, the yeah. word God alone has so much baggage with it for a lot of people right. because it's been weaponized mm-hmm. against them and who That's they right. are that I just want to show that even when even you can feel love and you can mm-hmm. feel eternal love in the presence of God, even if someone's not using the language that you're used That's to. Right. And it's fascinating to me that I can write something about bold unbridled hope and someone mm-hmm can respond and say, I sense God's love in what you're sharing. And thank you for saying that. So I feel like everything I just said is one big mess, like a long paragraph that was not broken up. into. No, I love it so much, (laughs) but I, but in some ways I'm like, I think that's the spiritual journey. I think that's it. I love it so much. It's it's kind of this like interwoven thing with all these Mm -hmm. different things that are happening inwardly and outwardly. That's right. And there's so much grace to travel through that. So, yeah. so yeah, that's kind of a, a big shift that happened. It's just realizing like, even with language, there's so many yeah. different, there's so many things that, that I, I just want to continue to spend time with. And as somebody yeah. who still identifies as a Christian, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I want to, I want to be, I want to be present to that. I don't have answers for, <laughs> for it, yeah. but it's like, I want to be present to that. And I, and I want to to continue to spend time with that. So, yeah. I am so drawn to that. Um, and that sense of trading in certainty for curiosity and holding our hands, like open to language. I mean, all the ways that God can reach us and speak to us and move us and connect with us outside of this sort of rigid set of, of words and forms, um, Mm -hmm. is wonderful. And we don't even have to defend it because when you put your work out in the world, when you put your art out in the way in which you do, the fruit speaks for itself. It it moves people. It delivers love and joy and peace and patience and all those things that we say we care about. And, um, turns out we don't get to prescribe to God how it is he can speak. Um, and so I love that you have discovered this freedom in your own faith, in your own work, um, at this stage in your life, because you have so much pavement ahead of you. I mean, Mm -hmm. your, your best work's ahead of you. And so Mm -hmm. to be like launching from such a beautiful, healthy, spiritually curious place of depth. I mean, I am watching you. And I am cheering for you. And I literally cannot wait to see what else you create. Relationships are so important. We know this. Family, friendships, partners, colleagues. But I want to talk about an equally vital relationship we sometimes ignore or forget about. And that's the one with our own selves. You matter just as much as everyone else does. So this month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you of this. And that therapy is a great way to make sure you are showing up for yourself. I am so absolutely protective of my therapy appointments. They are just as important as any other thing in the day. 
BetterHelp makes that part easy for you though, because it's all online with video, phone, and live chat sessions with your therapist. So wherever you are, you can do this and you don't have to see anyone on camera if that's not your thing. BetterHelp is also much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. So here's the gentle nudge to add some true self-care. Give BetterHelp Online of Therapy a try and just see why over 2 million people have used it. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And For the Love podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash for the love. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash for the love. This is the last question. And I ask everybody this question, Morgan, no matter what the series is. This is from Barbara Brown Taylor. I don't know if you've ever read any of her work, but she's profoundly (laughs) gifted. Okay, of course. Of course you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She asks, what's saving your life right now? And feel free to answer that however you want to. Mm, Yes. What's saving my life right now is just reflecting on this past year coming up on the anniversary of my diagnosis and Mm -hmm. realizing how much growth I've experienced. I feel like this has been the year where I've, I've been able to see it the most clear I've ever seen it. Um, and a lot of it has just been, I've had a lot of time to reflect. It's been very hard to look back. Um, and not even sometimes like sometimes there's been some anger, like anger mm-hmm. at myself or others as to how I was treated or different things that have happened. But within that, I have felt that I have really, truly grown and I've learned to be more of myself. And I feel for me, that feels like a gift from God. And I'm so mm-hmm. grateful for it. And I continue to share as much as I do, because I believe everybody deserves that. I believe everyone deserves to feel seen mm-hmm. and loved and known in, in, in whatever capacity to say like, oh yeah, I've, I've been through some stuff, but I'm also me. And I'm so proud of how far I've come and how I've grown mm-hmm. and how I've continued to grow. So that, that keeps me going every day. I get so excited about other people, and I don't just mean diagnosis, I mean just whatever it is of so yeah. like other people saying, Oh yeah, this is me. Right. And I'm I'm so proud to That's be right. me and I'm so excited to to be me. So yeah, I've been really, really grateful for that. Fantastic. Can you before I let you go, just tell everybody where they can find you. If they're not already following you, they have to immediately. That is, this is not up for debate, <laughs> listeners. And so tell everyone like where to find all your things. Yes. So I'm Morgan Harper Nichols, pretty much everywhere. That's my Instagram Mm -hmm. handle, Morgan Harper Nichols. And my website, morganharpernichols.com. I try to kind of have all the links there easy to find for my book, my app, my podcast, all that good stuff. So yeah, yeah, that's me, Morgan Harper Nichols. Great. Um, I'm in your corner and I'm really proud of you. And I'm so thankful to just, um, be standing next to you as you really serve the world in the special way that you do. And, um, any way that I can ever support you and, um, champion your work. I want to, and I will. So, Mm. um, just so much love here from Texas. And, um, I just, I'm, I'm watching you and I can't wait to see what you do next. You've like inspired me and you've moved me and your words have mattered to me. Um, and I know my community too. So lucky me to have you on the show today. Thanks for being here. (laughs) And thank you. Thank you so much. All right, guys, listen, um, step number one, if you don't already time to go follow her, um, follow her on Insta. If you're over there, it's just every single day, you will be happy that you do. Okay. Every day when her posts comes up in your feed, you will be like, this was such a good quality follow. Um, let's, and, and by her work, she's, she's so special. Um, I'm, I feel lucky to have talked to her today. Um, by the way, if you're like, where do I, where do I find it all? As always, if you go to jenhatmaker.com underneath the podcast tab, um, we'll have not only this whole episode, but we'll have the show notes and then we'll have links to absolutely everything Morgan. So it's kind of a one stop shop for you. If you are interested in more, um, we'll have our website, everything. So 
Um, she is phenomenal and I love to celebrate her work. We have so many good guests in this series. Like (laughs) I just keep responding back to my podcast team. Like this interview was incredible. And then, and this interview was also incredible. You guys, and this person is phenomenal. Like it's just an embarrassment of riches. And so, um, don't miss any episodes here. If you have go back and pick them up. These are interesting and smart and courageous and innovative people of faith who are moving the needle forward in so many important categories. And so lucky me to get to sit across from them. Um, okay. Thanks for listening. You guys, thank you for subscribing to the podcast. Do that if you haven't already done it. Um, and of course, writing and reviewing, we read all those. We've never not read one. And we always love hearing your suggestions on who you'd love to hear from and um, who you think I should know and host on the show. So you can always throw that into the mix and we are always paying attention. So more to come in the Faith Shaker series. And I hope you have a great week. See you next time.